Warning, this is not the full film, Loop on the Third, Fujiko Mine's Lie. Rather, this is a review of Fujiko's Lie. Fujiko's Lie is available for purchase through Discotech Media and wherever digital releases are sold. Before we begin tonight's episode, here's a reminder that the Dub Talk podcast may contain language and content that may not be suitable for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please be aware that this episode will contain spoilers for Fujiko's Why and may contain spoilers for other anime series, so please be careful if you haven't finished them. And finally, the views and opinions expressed by the participants of this episode do not reflect those of the Duck Talk podcast as a whole. Enjoy the episode. Fake, oh babe, can't believe, no, no, please let me know, my girl. If you have something to tell. Hello and welcome to Dub Talk Summer at the Movies, where a couple of gentlemen thieves get together and talk about our favorite anime movies in the summer. I am your host tonight, Lack the Watcher, and with me today is Jet. Hello. And tonight we will be talking about that classic anime and manga series, Lupin the Third, but with a little twist. We're talking about the Koike trilogy. Th- with this entry being Fujiko's Lie. This one obviously being more focused on Fujiko, and regarding her protecting a little boy by the name of Jean, who seems to have a spe- special inheritance that many, many villains are trying to get their hands on, specifically Godfrey. So, uh, yeah. Should we just go ahead and get started, or...? Uh, also, I mean, like, have you seen any of the uh, previous Koike stuff? Yes, I've actually watched most of them. Uh, this is the first time I've ever watched any... No, 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 that's not true. I was going to say this is the first time I watched it dubbed, but I actually did watch Jigen's Gravestone dubbed. I watched um, Goemon's Blood Spray in the original Japanese, though. Yeah. So. Uh, I tried to think. I haven't seen the Woman Gone for the Kamine, and I really should get on that, even though that's definitely out of print now. Uh, oh, I did oh, yeah. see I did see Jigen's Gravestone. That was actually like literally the very first loop on anything I watched. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting introduction to the series. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, the thing is, you don't really have to have watched the one we called Fujiko Mine to get the Koike movies. I, uh, yeah, I kind of figured, but yeah, it looked, because. The one we call Fujiko Media is actually a prequel to the entire Lupin series. It's not really connected to the Koike movies. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I've heard they're like in the same universe, roughly, but yeah, it's very roughly. Yeah. Space is warped, and time is bendable when it comes to the Lupin franchise. Uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of slowly pieced that together as I've like watched more Lupin stuff over the years. You think Tenchi Muyo's bad? Try Lupin. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, all right, I guess I'm going to get started. Yeah, I actually, I, I've liked these quick game movies so far, and I'm actually genuinely surprised that they're kind of leading to something. <laughs> Which I, I wasn't really expecting, honestly. It's like, uh, yeah, I knew there was like I knew there was some continuity, so I was like a little thrown off since I haven't seen Going on Blood Spray. Yeah. So there were so, so there were a couple of points in the movie where I was like, oh, okay, there is like some continuity that I'm so clearly supposed to know about. Yeah. So to start things off, we'll uh, go ahead with the uh, ADR script and director. The ADR script writer was Lawrence Stahl, and. Unsurprisingly, the ADR director was Tony Oliver. So, I mean, it's it's kind of funny to have a Lupin direct a dub where he's not playing Lupin. So, uh, yeah, but I mean, if you're going to get someone to direct Lupin, I mean, do better than Lupin, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Disco Tech is the one who's funding these dubs, right? Uh, that's like, uh, Disco Tech is distributing them, but I'm pretty sure, like, TMS is putting the bill for all these. Okay. Yeah, because TMS has been trying to do more Western stuff lately. Uh, yeah, they're even paying for more case clothes now, of all things. Yeah, go figure. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting, just, like, 
I, I find it kind of funny because you've got someone like Tony Oliver who's been playing Lupin for so long, and yet he goes, he, he's directing the, the new voice of Lupin, who we'll get to in a bit. Um, but it's, it's interesting how much more less cartoony this new Lupin is in comparison to his version of Lupin, which I know is appropriate given the, the you know, like, attitude of these particular Lupin entries, but it's it's just funny to me to see somebody who has their Lupin and is telling somebody else to do it a different way. I am. Oh yeah, but I think about it that way. That is pretty interesting. Yeah, and I mean, regarding Lauren Stahl's like writing for the script, I mean, it's great. I I wouldn't say it's too much of a deviation from like how Lupin is usually dubbed. I mean. <sighs> Here's the thing about the, the Koi Game movies. They're kind of just as ridiculous as anything else that Lupin has ever done. <laughs> True. Like, they're just... They're, they're like, we're the cool, edgy Lupin. And it's just like, yeah, but you're still just as weird. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's funny because if you really compare the two types of... Di like, the, the dialogue between the Funimation dubs, between the, the Jinian dubs... Between these current dubs, there's not dialogue wise, there's not that much of a difference. Yeah, uh, like, uh, Blue Bond's pretty consistent. Yeah, Blue Bond has always had kind of a bite to it anyway. I mean, if you look at the original Monkey Punch stuff, RIP, um, it, it's like, yeah, Blue Bond was a bastard. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I'd say it's all around pretty strong. Um,. The one thing I will say that these movies do, or OVAs, I guess, technically, that these OVAs do is they give the actors really a chance to be a little more nuanced in their performances than we usually get for Lupin. Mm, uh, I, I, I feel like it depends on like, which version of Lupin you're talking about, but... Uh, I mean, if it's like the specials, then maybe, but I feel like in like the last two TV series, like especially Part 5... Uh, you get like uh, they get to be like a little more three dimensional. I'd yes. say I'd say that's like especially true with like uh, with like Tony Armour's Lupin and probably Michelle Ruff's Musico. They uh, they get a lot uh, they get a lot more to do with Part Five. Yeah, I mean Part Five dealt with child pornography for crying out loud. Uh, so sorry, uh, uh, yeah, as expected of the Code Geass writer. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, Part Five was very good. And so, oh yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I mean, I'm not complaining. It's just like, it's just like you see all the subject matter in part five, and then you see who's writing it, and it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's always been a bit of an edge lord. As much as I love Code Geass, you know. But um, oh, excuse me. But yeah, no. All around, I think the direction and the writing is very strong. Um, you know, this this one isn't that plot centric. Like, it's really not. Like, there, there's a thing, and they have to go and... or Well, it's more like a thing, and they have to protect the thing, and that's basically what the movie is. <laughs> like, it, it's less it's less so getting a MacGuffin, so much as keeping a MacGuffin. So, uh, yeah, that's true. And, I mean, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not knocking the movie about it. I'm just saying that it's, it's not very plot-centric. There's not a whole lot to the story. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there were, I mean, there was definitely some parts of it I found pretty interesting, but on the whole, yeah, like it is pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, but it, but I got it. It's like an hour long, so I mean, there's yeah. so much they can really do with it. Yeah, it was funny when I was watching this. I was like, oh yeah, these aren't actually movies. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also wasn't expecting it to be movie length, so when I sat down, I was like, oh wow, only fifty eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> TMS is just throwing money at the uh, at the wall, I guess. Let's see what sticks. Uh, I mean, I guess something in between doing, like, yearly TV specials, which are finally coming back, I guess. And, uh, you know, looking at it now, I, I didn't realize how much, like, aesthetically similar this is to Megalobox. Like, uh, the, yeah, yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, like the designs and just the, the way everything's animated. I didn't even think about how Megaloboxy this whole series actually was. But... Um, yeah, alright, should we move on? Uh, I'm trying to see, I, I did have, like, a few extra notes. Okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so, like I said before, I haven't, like, 
seen the woman go through the Gamide or like Goemon's blood spray quite yet. Uh, but, like, again, I did see Jigen's Gravestone, which was the first Lupin thing I ever watched. And everything Lupin related since then is only, like, the Koike versus, again, like, on the grittier end of stuff. So I feel like if you are going to, like, go on the grittier end of things, I feel like uh, the way everything was handled here got that across really well. And, to, and there was definitely, like, a lot of grit in this dub from, like, the full original characters to, like, how the Lupin gig was handled. And so, Anna, we got a lot of that while, you know, still not being afraid to, you know, be funny every now and then because, you know, this is still a Lupin thing. Yeah. And I thought that Tony's direction kind of got all of that across really well. And same thing with Laura, with Laura Stahl's script. I thought it also had a lot of grit to it, but, and, you know, not being afraid to uh, spice up the dialogue in a couple of areas. And so, uh, especially some of the Indian there because, you know, this is a physico centered movie, so of course there's some of that. So, uh, so, and, uh, so, and, uh, again, while I'm probably personally gonna always gotta lean towards the, like, TV series cast, I, so, I thought that everyone here did a really good job of kind of putting their own spin on the franchise, so, uh, definitely no complaints about anything here sounded in particular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is why I'm not gonna be too upset if G-Kids decides to get a new cast for the, for Loop on the First, because I'm just like, well, it's... Lupin has had so many different actors that uh, nobody. Yeah, I I kind of like I kind of half and half on that. Like I wouldn't be like it wouldn't be like the end of the world, but I feel like we kind of have gotten to the point where we have like a consistent Lupin cast. So it would be yeah. nice just to like have that used. No, no, don't don't get me wrong. If they get the Ginian cast, I will be all for that. I'm not going to be like, uh, no, don't get it away from me. But I, I'm just like, there's no sacred loop. Well. Well, even then, I, I want to say Michelle Ruff is the sacred Fujiko, but even then, that's not true considering what we're talking about here. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like nobody is sacred in the loop on Dubcast, so it's not going to necessarily bother me if they don't do that, you know? Again, it's like it won't be the end of the world if they, like, don't recast everyone, but I would just, like, I prefer it. Yeah. So, uh, just because, I mean, just because it would kind of see, it would be kind of nice to get a TV cast associated with something that big, so. There is something kind of interesting that I just realized about this versus Lupin Part 5 and Part 4 specifically. It's interesting Richard Epcar directs the TV anime, but Tony Oliver directs these. Oh, yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> so. Like, I, I just thought about that, and I, not that it's probably, like, not that there's really any real reason behind it, but it, it, does seem like something I would be interested in knowing why that is. Uh, uh, well, I know Richard Epcar has, like, his own recording studio, and that's, like, where the TV series was done, for, like, whatever reason. Right. And then these were and then these were done at Bag Zoom, and Tony Oliver does work at Bag Zoom all the time, so I guess they were like, well, hey, just yeah. give it to him. Tony Oliver is Bag Zoom. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess they were like, well, he's here, he knows Lupin, just give it to him. Yeah, exactly. No, it's it's great. It's cool, and, and it's it's kind of cool to see a, a, a you know veteran Lupin help the the new uh, class out. Basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Like, I I don't know if he like directed Deacon's Gravestone, but I mean, um, like I would guess so. But yeah, I, I I could check that real quick. But uh, okay. So, so should we should we go ahead and, and move on to the cast? Oh, sure. Okay, so we're just gonna start off with uh, the um, with the henchman, and uh, that would be for for this it would be Randy, Hugo, and Carla, if I'm unmistaken. Uh, let's say uh, let's say uh, no, uh, not Randy. Randy is dead, actually. Oh, that's right. Yep. Okay, so it's just uh. Just, I think, just Hugo Bradley and uh, yeah. Carla. H Hugo Bradley and Carla. Okay, yes. Um, so, yeah. There's not r really much to say. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, Hugo is voiced by uh, Bill Millscap. Millsap, sorry. Um, Bradley is voiced by D.W. McCain. And Carla is voiced by Caitlin Galt. So there's not very much to say. Um, 
the, the characters don't necessarily do that much. I mean, how would you uh, how would you put it? Of these three, I mostly really remember uh, Caitlin Gallant's character. Uh, and that was mostly because uh, she was the one that's kind of like slapping Beacon around the most throughout the film, which... Uh, so, uh, which uh, we'll get to uh, which we'll get to beat him later, but uh, that's like a whole uh, weird thing. It's like, uh, but uh, like in general, I've always liked it with God's voice, so it's always got a nice hearing her do things. I think he has. I just kind of black eyes. He always has like this very mature, sidewar voice. It comes across really well. And so, and, and I like that you know, like with everything else in this film, there was kind of like a little bit of grit to it here. So. And so it kind of uh, matched uh, with the overall tone of this film we're kind of going for. Uh, the other two, I'm sorry to say, like, I don't remember too much of them. Like, I know they got to do some... I know they got to do some fight scenes with Lubon, which were, like, pretty... Uh, which were, like, pretty interesting. And they, like... They say, and they, like, and uh, all three of them actually got, like, really close to killing Lubon, like, by getting him into a car crash and then had to, like, hold him off at the last second. Yeah. <laughs> That <laughs> was just like I think this is like the closest I've ever seen anyone actually come to killing Lupin. <laughs> I, like, I mean, I mean, I mean, okay, well, okay, well, there was uh, what's his face in part five, but yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> Mamo too, technically, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't really have that much to add, honestly. Henchmen are, are never a great source for like standout voice acting. <laughs> They sounded fine. They yeah, sounded... Uh, yeah. I mean, henchmen can be. I mean, henchmen can be fun when they have like enough to do. But again, this is like an hour long, so. Yeah. Um. You have anything else to add? Hey, uh, not all that much in particular. Again, I only kind of really remember Caitlin Gallant's character. So. Right. Yeah. Carla is really the only standout. Usually, female henchmen are the standout anyway. So. Uh. All right. So, we'll move on. So, next we are going to do uh, the two more main villains. At least, one of them is definitely the main villain. Uh, we are going to do Codfrey and Binkham. Uh, Codfrey is voiced by uh, Danny Katiana, who you may know, uh, he's actually under a, um, a stage name for this. So, But uh, his, his voice you may recognize from... Naruto and and Gundam. He's more of a he's more of a screen actor than he is a, a microphone actor, but uh, he he's done some stuff here and there for like Bang Zoom and 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 the like in California. And uh, Bincom is voiced by the one, the only Billy Cats, who uh, there's plenty of things you may know him from, but the first thing that comes to mind for me is of course Josuke Higashikata. Um. Uh yeah, and I guess, like, more recent Toonami Avenger, you have, like, uh, Rui for Demon Slayer. Yeah. As I, uh, there was, his, I, uh, he's also been in stuff like Sirius Jaeger. As I, uh, right. Like the most, yeah. uh, one of the most cursed dudes who ever exist, Sword Guy the Animation. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was, uh, he was, a, he was a lead in Fate, he was a lead in, uh, Fate Extra, which is, uh, probably the one Fate thing I would absolutely not recommend to watch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot he was in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was, like, maybe, like, the second, I think it was, like, I think that was, like, his second lead role. And I yeah, I, th kinda, I like, think that was, like, when I, when I heard he was playing Josuke, I think I was, like, wait, the guy from that Fate thing? <laughs> <laughs> See, I the first thing I heard of him was Zord Guy, and he played a character that was like, kind, he played a character that was kind of a jock. So when I saw he was kind of a joke, I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, like, and of course he's great. He's great as Josuke, but we're not here to talk about JoJo. So, um, but regarding uh, both of them, they they both sounded fantastic. Um, Big Cap is an interesting type of villain, especially for Lupin, because he's this kind of, you know, soft-spoken, like, monstrous villain. And, you know, we've got characters like Mamo, but Mamo was more of a, a like, a, a Machiavellian villain. You know, he, he wasn't he wasn't this weird, like, Bleach-esque <laughs> type villain that Binkham is, you know? Yeah. 
the uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, Breaking Soul design in general is just kind of like weird and almost curse in a sense. Yeah, I mean, like as much as I like this, I do have to admit he feels a little like a fan fictiony villain. You know, like I don't know if he fits the Lupin aesthetic very well. Yeah, I, uh, I remember when I first saw the trailers for Fujiko's Lie, I was like, "This guy is the villain." Yeah. Yeah, I gotta admit, like, when I saw this character and I heard Billy Kometa's voice coming out of his mouth, uh, my immediate thought was, like, okay, so this is what would happen to Rui if he just, like, grew up to be a meth addict. And so, yeah. And, and so, yeah, and again, I'm, like, so have you seen any Demon Slayer? Uh, Demon Slayer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah like, the design, it literally just looks like, okay, what if Rui just, like, grew up to be a meth addict? But it's just, like, literally the character design. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, yeah, and I can't say like anything about the performance. Never really did like too much to change my mind on that. And uh, the yeah. movie comparison isn't like just because of the character design. I thought that like Billy's acting here kind of also reminded me a lot about how he handled that character. Well, he play he plays him like a petulant child in a lot of ways, which is good because that's kind of how you're supposed to play a character like this. So, yeah, so, yeah, there, yeah, there's a, yeah, it's very like very deep sided, but also kind of very childlike. And it kind of makes it sound really unsettling, but also kind of... But there's also just kind of a little bit of a rasp to it that just kind of helps you dial up the creep factor, and I yeah. I really appreciate that. Because he's a snake. He's, he's a snake guy. So... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> uh, Billy does the best with, with this character. I don't hate Bickham. I think he's fine. I just... He's a weird thing to do for Lupin, is all. Even for, even for the Koike movies. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, he didn't have that whole like weird like fake cursing people thing. We get, which was uh, definitely kind of a thing that stood out to me immediately because like as weird as the Lupin franchise can get sometimes, like at least from what I've seen of it, it does kind of seem to follow like the Scooby Doo rule of like not actually embracing anything supernatural outside of like maybe yeah. like maybe every now and then you'll get like one ghost, but that's kind of it. And there was that weird balloon man with the penis that tried to attack Fujiko and Jigen's gravestone. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, that wasn't thing, wasn't it? Yeah, which I remember thinking back then, even like this is weird for Lupin. Yeah, honestly, that's weird for the woman called Fujiko Mine. For as crazy as that series got, it never did anything like that. Oh but, wow. Is that? Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so literally, like, as soon as I saw that, I got it figured, like, okay, there probably is some, like, actual explanation behind how that whole curse thing works. And it's like, oh, okay, so there's, like, some weird science that doesn't, like, actually hold up at all, but, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll move on to, uh, to Kaufrey now. Uh, uh, also, uh, and, uh, and I actually didn't have a little more to say here. Yeah, um, much more traditional Lupin villain. So uh, I uh I did have like a couple more things on being good. Oh okay yeah go ahead. I am. Uh, it's like yeah uh, specifically in that while he didn't get like too much characterization since again this whole thing in like fifty eight minutes. Uh, what we do get kind of paints him as you know being a whole like psycho assassin murder child who doesn't really know too much beyond like following orders. So when he sees Fujiko and Fujiko like well both of Fujiko and uh, there will be more of that later. Uh, it's kind of interesting seeing him go, get, like, go from, you know, trying to just shrug her off during, like, the first time they meet, uh, to, like, by the end of their second encounter, basically sounding like a kid having his first boner, which was, uh, <laughs> definitely an experience, and Billy's, uh, and Billy's performance really carried that exact energy, and I appreciated that. I mean, he's, <laughs> this is Fujiko Mine we're talking about, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was definitely, like, the biggest highlight of Billy's performance, and... Uh, for what I feel, I thought he did a pretty good job of making, like, the characters sound pretty memorable. And I can definitely say that between him and Fuzikar's actors, I probably won't be forgetting that last scene in the movie anytime soon, because uh, that was a plenty of scene. Yeah, yeah, no, that actually was. Yeah, it was It was a good, like, spaghetti western standoff kind of thing. So. Yeah, okay, um, good to move on. Yeah, okay, um, Godfrey... Not visually or or design wise as interesting as Binkum, but um, overall pretty good villain. Uh, I thought he had some pretty effective scenes. I I thought he had a very powerful presence. Oh yeah, he definitely and, had like a very good like mob boss voice to him. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, that's kind of all you need for a character like this. 
it's yeah. it's really hard to talk about these two characters next to one another because <laughs> they're so <laughs> very different. So, uh, uh, yeah, they, yeah, they definitely do. They definitely do have like uh, they definitely do uh, say they're pretty good contracts with each other, even if uh, well, even if one does spend a fair amount of time just like abusing the other, which was uh, kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, so again, I'm pretty sure that whole again, I'm pretty sure that whole like assassin factory thing is like some ongoing part of the Corky films that I wouldn't know about because I haven't seen Blood Spray. But no, that kind of that. Well, I mean. Looking back on Bloodspray, I can kind of see where that was leading into this. But this whole Assassin Factory thing, I think that was, like, unveiled in this. So, like... I'm assuming the next one, whatever, it's going to be, like, Zenigata's Case or something like that. Whatever they're going to call it. Because I'm guess, assuming that... Oh, yeah, I guess it would have to be Zenigata's. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm ass Well, the, Zenigata's the only one left in the opening who hasn't gotten his own OVA yet. So I'm assuming Zenigata's the next one. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, it was probably going to be voiced by Richard F. Carr. Um, oh, that would be, be fun. Cool. Yeah. Um, but it's like... Yeah. Everything's kind of coming together. Um, I don't really have that much to say about Caffrey, honestly. Aside from he was a pretty good presence for the whole yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I thought I did not the script in particular gave him like, some pretty good one-liners, so I thought that was uh, pretty effective. Yeah, he 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 had a he had a commanding presence that made it seem like he could be in charge of all this weird shit. So you know, but uh, honestly, yeah, no. Uh, Danny Katiana did a very good job, and Billy Camus did a great job as uh, Binkum. Yeah, I definitely say like between the two, like Billy definitely pipes it out a little bit more for me. Yeah, but Binkum is more of a standout villain anyway. Uh, so like, yeah, true. <laughs> like. You remember a villain like Binkham, especially in something like Lupin, because he's like a fever dream villain where you're like, was that real? <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um, do we want to move on to the more like significant characters? Yeah, uh, yeah, let's go. Okay. So next up, we're going to talk about the kind of tertiary, but very, very connected to the main character's characters. This is going to be Randy... Uh, the father and Gene the son. The father go the Randy the father who goes missing, and Gene the son who is uh, basically taken in by Fujiko during the time. Um. So yeah, Randy is voiced by Ben Lepley, who at this point would probably be best known for voicing a My Mask, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, that kind of is his big thing. Yeah. Um. I'm not really seeing anything else that really stands out. Uh, he did some voices in Ghost in the Shell, SAC 2045, and Fire Emblem, but everybody's done Fire Emblem, so. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I get, uh, that does seem like it's basically a rite of passage for Kelly actors now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm sure they get excited when a new Fire Emblem game comes out, because they're like, yes, work! Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Jean is voiced by Erica Harlocker, who has many credits to her name, uh, and Takamaki from, uh, Persona 5, uh, Elizabeth from Seven Deadly Sins, um, yeah, Karapika from Hunter Hunter, Brr, list goes on and on and on, uh, anything else that really, uh, yeah, uh, Ruler, Jean d'Arc, and Fate Apocrypha, She's Videl in the uh, California super dub. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, that dub uh, did exist. I do kind of wish I had more episodes. Yeah. yeah I, so, I, I, was actually, I was actually kind of interested in listening to the California um, super dub. So, yeah, I, yeah I, like, I, did, like, I did see like some clips of it. Lex Lang was a weird yeah. Goku. Yeah, I don't like, know why they picked Lex Lang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like, uh, KD like, uh, Tang was like a pretty decent choice for Vegeta. I was, I was kind of like, I was both like, I was both surprised and like kind of happy they chose to go with Derek stuff and Princess Frieza because it's like, yeah, if you were going to pick a Cali actor to do Frieza, he would definitely be the one to do. So. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, and of course, Violet Evergarden. How could I yeah. forget Violet Evergarden? I think that was the one that I was like, wait, there's there's one left. But, like, oh uh, yeah, Violet Evergarden always a, or, well, yeah. I don't want to say always a good time because that's a very like dour show, but yeah. <laughs> I, I actually 
very much love Violet Evergarden. But that's me. <laughs> um, so, yes. Uh, Randy doesn't have much play in the movie. Uh, uh, yeah, he, yeah, he kind of, like, quote-unquote, dies in the beginning. Yeah. And then you find out he's, like, been alive this entire time because Fuzuko has been playing a long gun. Surprise, bitch. But you going to the last of me. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, he's fine. Ben, ben Lepley voices dad very well. So it's it works. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I don't. Yeah, honestly, I remember, honestly, I just more. I remember more of the twist than the actual than the actual performance, but. Yeah, but there's just nothing to Randy. He's just a dad. Yeah. You know, it, it it's like it, it's really not Ben Lefley's fault. It's just it's yeah. just a dad character. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just like, yeah. It's just like the whole nature of like the movie's lot. God, it's kind of weird because it's like. I, Okay, because it's like okay, so like Fuzuko helped him like fake his death, and so yeah. and it's like so like where was he? It's like where was he all that time? Like how did he not realize his son was like effectively being held hostage? I'm gonna make a disclaimer real quick because it sounds like I didn't like this OVA. I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely joined it. This one of those things where it's like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it sounds like we're being way more negative than we actually are positive, and I just want to make it clear, I actually did enjoy this, for as weird as I think the Koike movies are, I actually do think they're very well done. It's, so. uh, 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 yeah, this is really enjoyable, so it sounds like we don't have a whole lot of talk to talk about it, because again, this was literally like 58 minutes long. So. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> these things are supplementary stories, basically, if, if you just want edgier Lupin. This is what, you know, this is where you go. So... Uh, but Erica Harlocker is Gene. Gene is an interesting character because Ar Erica plays him so unlikably annoying, but that's the point. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, I think if people watch this, which I don't know if a lot of people did, preemptively I want to point out, if you think Gene is annoying, he's supposed to be. <laughs> he's uh... supposed to be an unlikable little shit. Who's constantly whining, and that that's kind of the point, because that's why Fujiko is like, you need to grow up, you need to be a man. Yeah, and it's like the uh, interesting part for me is that, like, while I, like, listen to a lot of Erica's uh, work at this point, and I can point her out pretty easily, I'd, I haven't ever really heard her do Little Boys before, I mean... Yeah. Okay, I mean, like, I mean, there is Curry P. I mean, there is Karapika kind of for her male voice, but that's, like, you know, a very. Karapika's supposed voice to be 17, though. That's the yeah. thing that yeah. always bugged me. I always kind of thought they would cast a guy for Karapika for the dub, and when they cast Erica Harlocker, I was like, okay, I mean, he's 17. He really shouldn't sound like that, but uh, whatever. I mean, okay, I mean, I can understand that because, uh, like, first and foremost, like, uh, Japanese was, like, Miyuki and Sawasi, so I guess we're keeping yeah. consistent with that. I didn't like, really like that either. No, no, I, no, I mean, like, but more importantly, like the whole thing with Karapika in general is that, like, his is that like his gender is like supposed to be very ambiguous in the beginning, where like yeah. you're not supposed to know what gender he is for like the first, for like the first arc or so. So like it makes sense he would cast somebody who oh, could sign okay. a this. Yeah, so, I get like, that. Yeah, I guess I get that. And I, I, I love Erica Harlocker. She's like one of my favorite VAs working right now. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, not... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess my point here is that, like, I had a hard time recognizing her, which is, like, you know, always a very nice thing. Right. And that's great. You know, and, and like, she does a great job with Gene because he's not supposed to be likable. And that's what's kind of interesting about him. So, uh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't hate him, but I didn't love him either because he was annoying. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I thought he did, like, a good job of making him, you know, come up I was confused and, you know, helpless and uh, generally kind of whiny a lot of the time. But I thought, I thought Erica, you know, did a good job of making all of his eggs through the film feel pretty believable since. Like, yeah. again, as far as he knew for, like, most of the film, he thought his dad was dead and that the lady who was trying right. to stand in for his mom, like, very clearly wants to take advantage of him. So. And to be fair, he's ten. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's kind of unfair to like rag on a ten year old who's like being annoying because it's like experiencing so much shit at once. Yeah, so. I yeah, I did think his dynamic with Fuzuko was pretty interesting since you know, while again, even he can kind of tell Fuzuko doesn't really care about him, but he's just so like desperate and confused that he kind of can't help but fall for Fuzuko's whole fake mob act. 
And then when Freezer comes out, so he just like does the best when he draws him aside and just kind of tells him to stop crying and get his act together. I thought that, you know, Erica did a good job, you know, making him tough up, toughen up just a little bit, so... I thought that was pretty well done, even though the whole situation in general is uh, kind of screwed up. I mean, like, again, I know it's Freezer going and all, but, like, if it's like his dad dies, you can, like, caught him into giving up money instead of messing up even by her standards. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, like... There's not really much to say. I mean, I think the most impressive thing about Erica's performance as Jean is the fact that it's really hard to tell that it's Erica Harlocker as Jean. Oh, so, so, oh, yeah, oh yeah, like, honestly, if I had not seen the credits, I would probably not have her for this performance, so, uh, yeah. good job. I mean, it was either probably going to be her or Erica, you know... <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, I know Erica Mendez does a lot of boys, but like she, she can't do all of them. You have to TV it up every night. Two Ericas. <laughs> but so, uh, 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 technically, I think there's like four in California now. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> it's got to be a little confusing. Um, and Ben Lepley, fine as Randy, but Randy's not really a big player. Uh, I just put him with Gene because they're congruent with one another. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's all around two good, strong performances. And Erica does a great job with, with the character. Um, Alright, do we want to move on to the two boys? Yeah, let's let's go. Alright, so, of course, you can't have a Lupin thing without, without, of course, the two main guys themselves, Daisuke Jigen and Arsène Lupin III. Lupin Trois. Um, anyway, uh, Arsene Lupin the Third. His role is reprised by Keith Silverstein, and Daisuke Jigen is actually supposed to be uncredited um, for his role in this one. So we are going to respect the actor's wishes, and we are not going to be mentioning him by name, but we will still critique his performance. So um, why don't we start with Jigen? Um, the actor in question. Uh, he does a really great job. It's interesting to hear him as Jigen. Because I'm so used to either Chris Sabat or Richard Epcar. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard uh, Chris Sabat, but I'm definitely pretty familiar with Richard Epcar at this point. I, uh, I'm i going to be honest, and this is probably a controversial... I like Richard Epcar more as as um, Zenigata and Chris Sabat as, um, as Jigen. But that's just because I really like Chris Sabat's Jigen. Also, my first experience was a Funimation dub, so maybe that has something to do with it. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty fair, I guess. Yeah. Um, but Michelle Ruff is always the Fujiko. As much as I like the actress who plays Fujiko in this. But basically, she's just doing a Michelle Ruff impression. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, uh, but yes... Jigen doesn't have a ton of play in this one, but at the same time, I think it's a really strong performance. I think the actor brings coolness to Jigen, which is something you really, really need. Um, and it's a voice that fits Jigen, I would say. Uh, uh, let me see where my notes are for this. Uh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I also really kind of like the voice. I'd say that kind of like next to like Fuzuki's actor, I thought uh, Jigen's was like probably the uh, biggest dead ringer to his counterpart in the TV series. I mean, I mean, like he sounds like a little more youthful than Richard Epcar's, but it's still Jigen, so it's so it still sounds a lot like a jaded old man who just kind of you know seen just about everything. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I necessarily agree that he sounds a lot like Richard Epcar, I, but again, I think the voice works for Jigen. Oh, oh because yeah. Because like, like, like I said before, none of the actors in Lupin dubs are sacred. <laughs> like, you can interpret the... Personally, I think one of the best dubs, at least from what I've heard, is one that was done in England. <laughs> like, I, I won't go into too many details, but if you know anything about, like, Lupin dubs, you probably know what I'm talking about. There was a there was a few dubs, like Lady Liberty, that were done by an English dubbing company. And the actors were really, really well cast. Like, everybody sounded the way they were supposed to sound. So. Ah, but anyway. uh, cool. I uh, might actually uh, say that out at some point. Uh, 
Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, hey, I mean, I've heard enough different Lupons that I guess it's probably worth checking out. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I yeah, I I really like Jigen's actors here. Jigen's actor here. I thought uh, he did a good job of you know getting across a lot of Jigen's. Uh, you know, kind of wisecracking attitude as he kind of starts at some of Lubon's antics while still, you know, uh, kind of playing along with them. And I kind of like that whole, and I kind of like that whole bit where, like, he and Lubon kind of give a hand to Fuziko after he gets captured and, like, I thought that, like, uh, Jigen's reaction was especially on brand because he just spends the whole time wondering while they're going through all that effort when he knows he's just going to backstab them at the very first opportunity. And sure enough, as soon as they get to the hotel after that, he just kind of ditches them and I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, well, that's Fuziko. So, yeah. I mean, I was I, 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 I love Fujiko to death, but I do not trust her for one second. Oh, I was like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, definitely not. I, say, I, uh, I, I would let my heart be broken by her, but. <laughs> um, I mean, that is basically the running theme of this movie, but. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's Lupin's mantra right there. Um. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had, like, maybe a little more to say on this, since, like, Jake is obviously a pretty major franchise character, but again, for the context of this movie specifically, he doesn't have a whole ton to do outside of just helping Lupin, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, I mean... It's, I, it's kind of funny to see, like, Lupin and Jigen be kind of jobbers in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're very much just there to kind of help move the plot along. Yeah, and that's fun, and it's kind of nice to see Lupin not at the for. I mean, he hasn't really been at the forefront of any of these movies, but the fact that he and Jigen are both kind of on equal grounding in this one is what makes it kind of fun. Yeah. So, it's a, and, oh, yeah, sorry. A, oh, no, I was just going to say that, yeah, again, I really liked this, and I definitely did dig this actor in Jigen's gravestone, so I do think he's a very good Jigen. Again, it's just like, in the concept of this one, he didn't have, like, a whole ton to do in comparison. Yeah, Jigen has, like, literally no stake in any of this one. Um, Alright, so... Let's move on to the man himself. Mr. Arsene Lupin III. Voiced, uh, once again, by Keith Silverstein. And, yeah, it's a good, like, more grounded, less cartoony Lupin. That's what I really like about Keith Silverstein's. Uh, yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting that while Lupin only ever had, like, maybe two fourth actors in Japan, and the second one is really only ever because, like, the first one passed away in the 90s. Right. But there's been at least, like, five different Lupin voices in English. And, he, like, and even though I didn't know much about the franchise for a long time, I've always thought that, like, the argument of who the best dub Lupin was was always, like, a pretty hot topic. Like, like you have, like you have people who are like pro Teddy Straight. You have Tony Oliver people. You have Bob Bergen. It just kind of goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's honestly most, if well, not all of them, but most of the men who have voiced Lupin have done a good job. Honestly, like Bob Bergen. A lot of people don't realize this. Bob Bergen kind of created the Lupin voice. Like, if, if you look at the original Castle of Cagliostro uh, dub, that's basically where all the future actors got the idea for their Lupin voices. Because he was kind of the one to take it straight from the Seiyu and kind of give him a voice like this. So. Mm. Uh, yeah. my, fr my friend Aaron, who's a big Lupin fan, uh, he, he kind of was the one who introduced me to a lot of stuff and... Specifically, how Bob Bergen was kind of the first one to kind of create the American Lupin voice. Yeah, you know, even David Hayter sounds fine too, and he kind of does his own thing. <laughs> That's a, oh yeah, David Hayter was one of them, wasn't he? Yeah. He looks at he looks at Fujiko and he says, "Yes, I do believe love can bloom on a battlefield." <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, at this point, Tony Oliver is like, I guess, kind of more or less won the Lupin war, and he's kind of like more or less the definitive English Lupin now, but, like, again, the very first time I'd ever watched a Lupin thing in general was Jigen's Gravestone, so my first exposure to Lupin was through Keith Silverstein's performance. Sure. And, yeah, and it definitely is kind of interesting comparing it to both, like, Tony Allward's performance and, like, some of Keith's other work in general, because... Oh. Or even, like, my favorite Lupin, Sunny Strait. Like, Sunny Strait is a little more grounded than Tony Oliver, but he's still kind of cartoony. So... Oh, yeah, I... I... I think I haven't, like, ever really heard any of Sunny's Raids. I probably will whenever I get around to 
a little bit called yep. Vince Gummy Day, but uh, again, that's not a print, so I'm just gonna have to like, sit and wait for Disco Deck to eventually rescue it. Not that I, not that I think he'll ever hear this, but Tony Oliver, if you do, I want you to know that I love your Lupin too. So. <laughs> Sunny Strait is just my favorite. Um, but yeah, regarding Keith Silverstein, um, yeah, no, I I really like his Lupin. It's it's really nice to see kind of a, a more mature sounding, more like human sounding Lupin, and it's it's a good counterbalance to a lot of the Lupins we've heard. And I know that Keith Silverstein is like a big Lupin fan, so it's kind of cool that he kind of fan ascended to be able to voice Lupin in a special kind of project like this. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, um, that was that was something I was told. Like when he first got cast in uh, in Jigen's Gravestone, was like that he's he's a big Lupin fan. So he even looks a little like Lupin. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, he's the kind of fan. So I guess that's definitely fan. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the BTA, uh, B BTBA page right now. You put Lupin and Keith Silverstein right next to one another, they kind of look alike. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, like, for me, uh, like, before I heard his Lupin and Giga's Grape Suit, I was kind of used to him playing uh, villains like, you know, like Elon Lieber from Monster or, like, Kimimaro and Naruto. And while I knew he could do, like, comic relief... Um, his Lupin was definitely a little bit more loose and laid back, and I was kind of used to him at the time. I mean, but of course, since then, he's playing characters like, you know, Speedwagon and JoJo, so I'm kind of a little more used to this sort of tone from him. Uh, but even then, this voice is still, like, a little distinct from some of the other characters he's played. Uh, like, again, compared to Tony Armour's Lupin, which, you know, sounds exactly like the kind of voice you would expect from a cartoon legacy character. Right, because uh, it's taken from kind of the Seiyuu yeah. of Lupin, so... Yeah, uh, Keith is, again, a little bit more, like, late down to earth and kind of laid back. Uh, which, like, under normal circumstances would feel kind of weird for Lupin, since he's kind of generally anything but that. Uh, but it works for the tone of these films, and again, like, the Corky first stuff is kind of, you know, on a little bit of the grittier end compared to other Lupin incarnations. And Lupin's grit, def and uh, Keith's Lupin definitely has a lot more grit to it than Tony's does. And, uh, like, as far as this movie goes, he's just kind of mostly there in the background, kind of running his own scheme alongside Jigen. Uh, but from what we do see in him, I definitely like that there's, like, this very natural confidence in Keith's voice and uh, really fits Lupin. And you kind of get the sense that no matter what he's doing, he's kind of, like, either scheming something or just kind of thinking a few steps ahead of everyone else. And uh, that's very much on brand, so I definitely liked it. Yeah. I uh, Kenichi Kurita is the current seiyuu for Lupin. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't look it up. I just kind of can't remember the name. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't remember. I'm, I'm the bigger Lupin fan here, and even I couldn't remember. Okay, don't feel too bad. Until I like looked it up, like maybe a year or two ago, I just kind of assumed it was a uh, Kape Yamaguchi because for some, I don't know why I assumed it was Kape Yamaguchi. I just kind of like, I think I heard somewhere that he was like the current voice for Lupin, and it was like, okay, I know he could probably do it, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah. But overall, yeah, two great performances from two great actors for playing two great characters. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I had, like, maybe any negative to say about Keith is that, um, is that, is that like, you know, like, maybe the uh, couple of instances, like, during some of the action scenes were, like, they were going for some comedy. I thought that, I thought that some of Keith's delivery could have maybe been, like, a little funnier, but I didn't think it was, yeah. like, too big an attraction, and, like, overall, I definitely enjoyed it, so, uh. I feel like Tony probably told him to play it down a little bit. Uh, for, yeah, yeah, I could, yeah, I could probably understand that. Yeah, just because he's probably trying to make it really feel like its own thing. So, and with Keith Silverstein being a fan, maybe he's trying to unlearn how to play Lupin so he can do it in his own way. So, ah, uh, um, yeah, that's a. Uh... But all right, we will move on to the femme fatale herself. We are finishing up talking about a one Miss Fujiko Mine, voiced by the one and only Christina V, who you of course will know from um, also from Hunter Hunter. She's uh, Killua in that. Um, she's Shante, and what's the other good big stuff she's been in? Um, uh, you know, you've got a uh, good old Homer at uh, Madoka. Um, Miki in Devil May Cry, or, or, not Devil, in Devil Man Cry Baby, sorry. Um, yeah. 
Is it? I, 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 mean, I was going to say Dora Hidora because that's on my mind because I've been watching it, but we probably aren't going to do an episode on that, so I guess I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, she's Darkness in, uh, in Konosuba. That's yeah. a big one. Um... Yeah, Sakura and, and a lot of the fate stuff. Ah, poor Sakura. She deserves better. Yeah, she really does. Hawk <laughs> in Seven Deadly Sins. One of her more uh, unique roles. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, and of course, for all you Miraculous Ladybug fans, she's Marionette. So. I, really, I really should catch up on that show. I've only, like, seen season one. Yeah. Sorry, ma Marionette. Not Marionette. Um... I've I've never watched Miraculous Ladybug, so. Uh, uh, I mean, it, I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty fun show if you're like okay with like uh, kind of low key magical girl stuff. Yeah, no, no, it's I've always like looked at it and been like, oh, I can see the appeal of this, but I've never just sat down and watched it. So. Um. Okay. So her Fujiko, it's very very good. Um. At the same time, if you put it next to Michelle Ruff's Fujiko, I probably couldn't tell you which is which. <laughs> as a, as a, uh, yeah, like I really, I'm a, like a really big fan of Christina V, and I can point her out pretty easily these days. But there definitely have been at least a couple of points where she was like a near dead rigger for Michelle Ruff. And when I first yeah. listened to her Fuzico and Jenkins Gravestone, that was probably like the best, the biggest example. Like literally until she pointed it out herself, I actually kind of assumed it was Michelle in that movie. You so. know, I'm, I'm fairly confident I was the same way. Like, I, I, I assume my, probably my first reaction was just, oh, Michelle Ruff's playing Fujiko in this. So, but I, no, lo and behold, no, it's Christina V doing a remarkably one-to-one -one Michelle Ruff impression. I don't know if it was intentional. If it wasn't, I apologize. But it sounds a lot like Michelle Ross from Chico Mide. Yeah, I mean, I don't want. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to spend like too too much time like harping on it exactly on how similar they sound because I don't think it's like super afraid of Christina's work here because I didn't care if Fuzico does sound a lot more distinct here than it did in Deacon's Gravestone. Yeah, honestly, kind of had a little bit more time with the character. If it, if it was intentional, I want I do want to defend Christina V's choice in, in, in impersonating. Like, a lot of the, the character trope, or a lot of the, the uh, like, just quirks that Michelle Ruff does for her Fujiko. Fujiko, like, Michelle Ruff based her Fujiko voice off of Marilyn Monroe. So, there's definitely that kind of personality element that, when applied to Fujiko Mine, works extremely well. So, I, I feel like maybe Christina kind of took that... And sort of applied it to her Fujiko, and it just kind of sounded a lot like how Michelle Ruff does hers. <laughs> ah, so. um, yeah, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I could definitely see that maybe. Uh, I will um, say, I will say that one thing that kind of stood out to me immediately about like her Fujiko compared to Michelle's Ruffs is that uh, Christina definitely sounds like a lot more youthful and soft spoken, where yep. Michelle's is definitely like a little bit more mature and sultry. Uh, it kind of made the beginning of this movie a little weird because like. The movie opens up with Fujiko serving as a maid and pretending a little boy, which is kind of, like, extremely out of character for Fujiko. And, like, and Christina, like, and Christina was, like, so... And Christina's performance in, like, playing the whole motherly act was so sincere in the beginning that it almost didn't feel like Fujiko to me. And because, yeah. and because I didn't know exactly what this film was going for, I was kind of ready to write it off for, after the first right. couple of I minutes. I mean, I, I, I kind of almost <laughs> fell for it, but I was like, no... You Irene Adler bitch, you're not doing this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, the further I got it, but the further I got into the movie, the clearer to be it became. that Fujiko was just you know, Fujiko was acting out of character. Fujiko acting out of character was kind of the point, and when it became clear that he was just pulling one really, really big long con and suffering this poor kid, uh, we do see more of the facade drop and more of Fujiko's actual personality starts to come out a little bit. Yeah, no. As much as I've been joking about how much it sounds like Michelle Ruff, Christina puts in a fantastic performance in this dub. Like, do not get me wrong. It is excellent. Her acting is superb in this uh, dub. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah, I agree. Whether it's, like, that whole bit where she's, like, seducing a guy at, like, the front desk of a hotel to, like, get into an inn for free, or, you know, just, like... Yeah. Or, you know, just, like, whenever she's, like, interacting with Gene, trying to help him get his, his acting get her about Christina... Uh, she handled both, like, the Soul Street side and, you know, kind of the very, like, kind of down-to-earth realist side of Fuzico really well. 
Yeah, I mean, in the end, she did, she did care for Jean in her own way, but uh, I guess in a very like Fujiko way. Yeah, as 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 much as Fujiko can feel human emotion. Yeah, uh. yeah, but uh, speaking of Fujiko's sultry side again, it's kind of impo it's kind of impossible to talk about Christina's performance without uh, breaking up the climax of the movie between her and the Lincoln Mansions big gum. Uh, because yeah. again, while Christina or we can while Christina had done a pretty good job of showing uh, how seductive Fujiko could be when you know she started turning on the guitar during their prior fight, uh, the way Fujiko comes out to him like at the end of their last fight, it kind of convinces him that all he really wants is her. Uh, that felt like a scene straight out of a straight out of an audio port, and Christina's V's performance is so dripping with sex. It uh, it was really something to listen to. I uh, may or may not have gotten no time listening to that. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Cool. <laughs> I, I lost you there for a minute. Like, what's going on? No, 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 I, think, no, I think I may or may not have gotten a job listening to that, so uh, I'm thinking that way. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is Christina V. Oh. Yeah. So, and so, uh, so, yeah, I guess that's as good an endorsement as any that he had a really good handle on her Fujiko, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love Christina V's Fujiko Mine. Um, I just... I love Michelle Russ more, so that's just how I'm. Like, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure very few will disagree with that. So. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, if I mean, if I were comparing the two, I would like definitely lead more towards Michelle Russ. But I, uh, uh, but for the purposes of, but for the purpose of this movie, I thought I also thought Christina D did a really, a really yeah. incredible job here. I definitely have no complaints about how she handled it. It's 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 hard to come at this as a, being a hardcore Lupin fan that I am, like because you you have such ingrained like the history of this series and the history of how it came over to the states, and just like who is so a part of the history that like it, it can just be kind of strange to to open up to new things. When it comes to Lupin, I have no problem like watching new stuff with new dubs. Like I said, if Lupin the First gets a new dub cast, I have no problem with that. But it's just you have so many certain voices that you imagine for the characters. Like it's just it's it's really strange to like come in and hear new voices. And even then, it's like you know Christina V's like she carries over a lot of the things you expect for Fujiko. And that's that's great, and it, it it, and I think it helps the performance a lot. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel I feel like I'm like a little more sympathetic because again, Jigen's gravestone was again the very first Lupin yeah. thing I watched. So, <laughs> and so I guess for my I guess for like my, my purposes, Christina V was the first music I heard. So. And that's great, and it's <laughs> it's great that you know these new like Lupin things can bring in new fans because like once you've seen. Like, something like Jigen's Gravestone, you know, somebody like me can be like, oh, um, if you'd like that, um, try Mystery of Mamo. Because even though it's a little sillier, it's also got a little bite to it in the way that this one did. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah I did the time it was kind of perfect because literally right, right after I watched Jigen's Gravestone, like, part four yeah. was coming out, so... Yes, <laughs> and that's, that's something totally different. <laughs> I, I, no offense, man, but I do want to tell everybody, don't start with Jigen's Gravestone. <laughs> I say, uh, I say, yeah, yeah, like, literally, if I were, were introduced to get it with a loop on now, I'd say, like, yeah, just start with part four. Yeah, start with part four, or, or even the old stuff, honestly. Like, I almost I almost don't want to recommend Castle Cagliostro as your first loop on. I say, I, yeah, like... Because yeah, then I, you've got the opposite problem. I say, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah, like, I, I still haven't, like, seen Cagliostro, but, like, literally everything I hear about that movie is that, like, Lupin oh, is a lot softer in that movie, so it would be, like, a very weird introduction. It's a great Hayao Miyazaki movie, but it's a terrible Lupin movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's great, but if you want that to be your jumping-off point for Lupin... You, that is not a good place to start with Lupin. Because you're just going to be like, oh, this guy is an asshole, and other stuff. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's a joy of the franchise, I guess. Yeah. 
Um, with that, though, Christina V does a fantastic job, and I know I've been harping a lot on how much she sounds like Michelle Ruff, and I apologize. Uh, I you know that's a little tacky, and uh, but I want to say I think Christina V gives a fantastic performance in this. So... Yeah, uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's about time to wrap this up. Yeah, I would say so. So, overall thoughts? As, uh, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed the dub to this. Yes, I, th I thought, uh, I thought all the performances here were really solid. I uh, thought Tony on Resurrection brought the uh, right amount of grit to this, and same here with Laura Saul's script. Um, again, all the performances here were pretty on point. Especially, especially Christina V as Fuziko and Erica Harlater as Dean. I thought they had a pretty good dynamic going for them. And so, and again, I thought uh, Christina V had a really good handle on Fuziko as a dire character. And if nothing else, I will definitely never, ever forget the last five minutes of this movie because, like, dear lord. <laughs> that, that is something I probably should mention, is the fact that this is Christina V's only third time voicing Fujiko in, like, long stretches and the fact that she has this character down so well at this point is remarkable oh yeah like and and the rest of the cast too like like Jigen's actor and Keith Silverstein as Lupin like the fact that they have these characters down so well even this recent of being cast in these roles is extremely impressive but then again they are being directed by Lupin <laughs> that probably yeah. helps. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely helps. Like again, personally, like the TV series cast is probably going to like always be like the definitive loop podcast for me. And so, uh, yeah. but, uh, but if you, uh, but if you need alternatives, like this is definitely like a very good alternative cast. I so, I think everyone here is doing a really good job putting their own spin on the franchise, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to like seeing more coming out of this universe. I definitely got to go back and watch Blood Spray. I would assume there's only going to be one more, but I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> because we're running out of characters. <laughs> Unless the last one is supposed to be about Lupin, but I'm not holding my breath for that. So. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens but there. Either way, I liked Fujiko's Lie. I thought it was fun, and I think the overall the dub was really, really good, really strong. Christina V does a fantastic performance leading this whole thing. Um... Yeah, no, really, no complaints at all. So. Uh, so, uh, uh yeah, it's uh, definitely worth, uh, definitely worth checking out. Definitely you should see it if you can, and uh, and uh, you can definitely say that depending on how this is edited, we have probably spent more time talking about this than it would take to actually watch the movie. So. <laughs> actually, yeah. No, basically, you you could put this on at the same time as the OVA, and it would be wrapping up right around the same time. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this went on a little longer than I probably expected it to. Uh, it's an hour, that's not so bad. Anyway, um, so, yes, would you like to, like, tell people where they can find you, Jet? Uh, yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dividing, where I will, uh, usually just be uh, talking about cartoons or anime or, like, video games or whatever. Uh, you can also sometimes find me on my blog, Animation Infinity, where I will, like, sometimes write things. And, it's a, and uh, I guess just recently I did an article for a and about black voice actors, so uh, check that out, I guess. That's right. Way to go, man. Awesome. Uh, thanks. And uh, anything else? Um, not especially yet. Oh, uh... Is it, uh, oh, uh, if you want to hear me on another podcast, you can usually hear me alongside uh, fellow Dub Hawk. Dub Talk host Andrew on Podcast OA, where we'll usually just be talking about anime news. Cool. Awesome. Um, you can find me at Like the Watcher on Twitter. That's usually where you can find all my stuff. Uh, I have a YouTube that's a little inactive right now. Uh, I do want to get back to making videos, but I just, I've been so swamped with other stuff right now. Um, I am currently working on a Gangsta Bridge with a friend of mine, and we should have that out pretty soon. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. I'm voicing Warwick in that. Ah, cool. So, yeah, I'm doing my best deep Ian Sinclair type voice for that. So, um, yeah, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm currently working on my own webcomic, too, right now, actually. 
and the the artist is getting closer to finishing the first episode. It's going to be on uh, Canvas on on Webtoons, which is like the super indie like Webtoons thing. I may post it to other places too, depending on how I feel about it. But that's probably going to be the main place that you can find it. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. Find me on, at Like the Watcher on YouTube. I've got a TikTok now, Like the Watcher. I don't really do that much with it. Sometimes I recommend anime on that. But yeah. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Jet for joining me for this. Hey, no problem. Uh, uh, fun dining yep. with you. Yep. Um, so, yeah. I don't think we'll be doing another Summer at the Movies next year together. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but it was fun doing two in a row with you. Uh, so. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. It's uh, yeah, definitely always fun talking with you. Yeah. I think uh, me and Gigi actually have planned something for next year, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, thank you all for listening, and you can find Dub Talk at Dub Talk on Twitter. Yeah, that's where you find them. Uh, tw uh, Twitter, say, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Tumblr is dead. Uh, it is. <laughs> 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 If I, uh, in addition to, uh, in addition to YouTube, uh, you can find, uh, we also have audio versions of the podcast available on, I think, Podbean? Yeah. I'm sure if I'm wrong, Andrew or Lilac will come and kill me later, so. As you can tell, Stephanie doesn't give us a list of stuff to read off, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. But, yeah, thank you all for listening, and, um, Yeah. Uh, otaku on, my friends? Is that what we're supposed to say? It's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, otaku on, uh, otaku on people, and until next time, uh, say gold. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>